So first up, as I mentioned, we have Marco Colantonio, co-founder and portfolio manager at Resolution Capital. Thanks very much for joining us today, Marco. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'll start with a bit of an overview of the market. Um, clearly, investment markets are, are going through a, a period of adjustment. Uh, central banks have been rapidly uh, raising rates uh, with the added complication of geopolitics and, and supply chain uh, disruptions still reverberating through the economy. Uh, there's not been a lot of places to hide. Uh, stocks, bonds, crypto, everything's been hit pretty hard. And obviously, global REITs uh, have not been spared. Um, to be fair, to put into context, after a very strong rebound in 2021, um, where, where REITs returned a, a positive 30%, it's fair to say that 2022 has been a lot more challenging and, and we've given a lot of that back uh, in, in absolute terms. Um, now, uh, for the quarter ending uh, uh, 30th of September, uh, global REITs were down around about 12%, um, and, uh, and that underperformed global equities, which were down about uh, 6%. Uh, and in terms of the operating conditions that, that we're seeing in, in, in markets at the moment, um, the leasing market fundamentals are holding up reasonably well. Um, but where there's clear evidence of weakness so far has really been on the investment markets, the, the, the asset value side of things. Uh, and that's largely attributable to uh, debt availability and cost of debt um, uh, significantly changing. And so what we've seen is that the speculative, highly levered buyers uh, are no longer active. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, and generally a tighter lending market conditions and more conservative underwriting, uh, asset values are coming under pressure. Now, to be fair, there hasn't been a lot of uh, transactions, but anecdotally, asset values are, are probably off somewhere in the order of 10 uh, to 15 percent. And interestingly here, listed REITs have already reflected a lot of that. So the REITs are trading at around about 20 percent uh, discount to unlevered asset values, but the private market values, which typically lag, uh, have not reflected this, this rapid change in, in the pricing environment. And so um, we see a significant uh, dispersion between private and public market values. And while volatility is never um, pleasant, uh, it is a function of liquidity, um, uh, which the listed markets provide. Uh, and that's in stark contrast to the unlisted uh, property funds, where once again, uh, we're beginning to see some of the UK unlisted property funds uh, begin to restrict redemptions. Um, and so many of those investors, we think, are kind of living in a parallel universe where they report stable asset values, but they really haven't marked to market um, the underlying assets, whereas the listed uh, property markets have. So in terms of um, turning to the, the performance of the NED fund uh, in particular, over the quarter, um, you can see here that the, both the benchmark and our fund returns were down uh, a similar amount, about minus 11.6%, and I'll go over the main drivers of that uh, on the next slide. Um, but over the, the longer term uh, time frames, you can see that the fund is generally outperformed by a range of 100 to 100, 180 basis points uh, per annum. So in terms of the uh, attribution for, for the, um, the quarter ending 30th of September, um, we had some positive contributions on a sectoral basis from residential again, and uh, within that, our exposure to uh, single family and multifamily residential names in the US, um, which are generating very strong uh, rent growth uh, and contributing, in fact, to, to the ongoing CPI challenges that the US is having. Um, uh, also, uh, positively contributing for us on the residential side is, has been our underweight exposure to the European residential markets. Uh, and Europe is an area which is really struggling uh, because many of those European names have got too much leverage uh, in a rising interest rate environment. Uh, cash has also been a, a positive contributor in a falling market, obviously, um, and offsetting some of those positives at the bottom end of the spectrum. Um, on a sectoral basis, the healthcare sector uh, and our exposure to US seniors housing uh, REIT well tower, where elevated operating costs uh, in particular, labour and food uh, have been offsetting what has otherwise been uh, very good occupancy and rent growth um, uh, that we were expecting and we are seeing, um, as well as some uh, uh, FX headwinds uh, and interest rate headwinds that, um, that that stock is, has been facing in the short term. Um, and on the retail side of things, um, uh, that there's also been some um, uh, negatively detracting from the retail side of things has been our exposure uh, to Shaftesbury. 
uh, in the UK, uh, which detracted following its merger with, uh, with Capco. And on a regional basis, looking to the right hand side of this slide, um, you can see the UK was, was one of the big detractors. Um, and uh, we have around about 6% exposure to the UK in our portfolio, um, which is an overweight position and has been a detractor. We think the names that we own in the UK are very good businesses. Um, they've got exposure to reasonably resilient areas of the economy, you know, doctors' clinics, um, uh, student housing, uh, and good cash flow business in the form of self-storage. Um, those companies have got great balance sheets, but unfortunately the macro headwinds uh, have weighed on those stocks uh, and, uh, and they have detracted. Now, in a rising inflation environment, we think it's important to uh, remind investors that um, in our view, real estate can act as an inflation hedge. Um, and we can see here um, uh, on, on the left hand side of this slide, you can see that um, you know, over the last 25 odd years, REITs have been able to generate income growth, rental income growth, uh, greater than core inflation. And that's a result of a combination of a couple of things. Firstly, in the short term, you have leases that are uh, di either directly linked to CPI, um, or you also have contractual fixed rental increases uh, ranging between 1% and 4% per annum, um, which is helping to grow, uh, grow the revenues. And importantly though, in the medium term, uh, you've got rising construction costs that also underpin um, uh, rising rents. So all other things being equal, uh, a developer needs higher rents if it costs them more to, uh, to develop a building. Um, and if, if, as we're seeing right now, and you can see on the right hand side of the, the chart, that um, uh, newer buildings are costing a lot more. That's just construction material prices. Um, of course, there's uh, rises in labor costs, uh, interest costs uh, that developers are facing, uh, as well as delays in, in, in construction deliveries. Um, and so the combination of these factors means that either um, less property is being developed, new competitive stock is being developed, or that that is, is being developed um, and needs higher rents to, to justify uh, construction. Uh, now, of course, these preconditions for, for higher rents uh, also need uh, solid operating conditions within the real estate market. So let's have a look at how we're seeing uh, the three more, more important uh, aspects of uh, of fundamental drivers of real estate. In our view, uh, leverage, uh, supply and demand are the most important things to, to think about in real estate. And uh, they're summarised on these three, three uh, charts. So on the left hand side, you can see um, occupancy as a, a, I guess, a proxy for demand. Uh, REIT occupancy in the US is pretty close to all time highs. And so um, uh, even if we do enter a recessionary environment where there will be some occupancy loss, REITs at least are starting from a pretty good position from a fairly high level of occupancy um, and relatively low levels of, uh, of vacancy with the exception of office markets. Uh, in the middle uh, chart, you can see uh, construction or supply levels as a percentage of inventory. And um, uh, you can see here that at the moment, construction levels in the US, construction starts uh, are roughly in line with the long-term average. Now we'd be much more concerned about the, the outlook if we saw uh, construction levels well above the long-term average, which has been uh, evident in pro just prior to previous many of the previous property crashes um, of the 80s and, and the 70s. Um, so we're reasonably comfortable. Obviously, we, we, we do underwrite at a more granular level when we look at uh, individual uh, markets and individual stocks, but at a macro level, um, uh, construction levels are reasonably uh, subdued. And as I mentioned before, it's costing more and it's taking longer to, to develop. And then finally, the more, the most important, one of the most important things to look at from a, um, a real estate fundamental point of view is leverage. You do not want to be over levered at the wrong point in the cycle. And here, pleasingly, many of the REITs uh, are reasonably well levered. They've learned the lessons uh, of the global financial crisis. Uh, leverage is lower than it was back then. Uh, debt maturities are longer. Hedging of interest rates are, uh, is um, is more uh, is able to cushion some of the recent increases in interest rates, um, and uh, and we find that uh, apart from some pockets, there, there certainly are some pockets where there is uh, higher leverage. Uh, so, for example, in Europe, as I mentioned earlier, um, and pockets of Japan, Japan and, and Singapore are, are too highly levered. But on the whole, we're reasonably comfortable that the REITs uh, are not over levered. And in terms of our portfolio, um, the the loan to value ratio, which is a, a measure I think that most people are more familiar with, um, is, is less than 30%. So a reasonably 
uh, lowly levered, particularly compared to some of the unlisted property uh, funds that, that we hear about. 85% of the debt is, is interest costs are hedged, and the weighted average maturity is over six years. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, real estate, uh, listed real estate markets um, have already largely reflected a lot of the downside in, in asset values that we have seen so far. And then that's not to say that we might not see further downside in uh, all asset uh, values and, and REITs included, but certainly we believe that um, uh, the, the REITs, the listed markets, are trading at a significant discount to the private markets. Um, so this is on a levered basis, 29% at the moment, um, which equates to about a 20% um, discount to unlevered asset values. Um, so one of the some of the themes that we've been talking about in terms of positioning for the portfolio um, uh, is uh, has to rhyme because it's easier for us to remember, but it's beds, meds, and sheds, um, and these are the areas that we think are uh, most relevant in terms of secular growth drivers, relevant to the economy as things stand at the moment. Beds clearly referring to um, uh, both rental housing, where there are shortages in, of housing in many markets. Um, and, uh, and also includes a, a broad range of different formats of residential, including multifamily and single family, uh, particularly single family in the US, which is structurally undersupplied. Um, uh, manufactured housing, which is uh, caravan parks, and student housing, which is typically very resilient during um, uh, recessions. Uh, on the med side of things, it plays to the aging population. And so we have the ability to, to get exposure to the likes of seniors housing, but also life science labs, uh, doctors, clinics, and, and medical office buildings. And, and sheds um, is related to e-commerce and, and those parts of the real estate market that are, are exposed to the, the um, uh, both the logistics but also the digitization theme through data centers and, and, and towers. Um, and all three of these sectors, uh, we believe, uh, are growing at um, a good, good structural underlying uh, growth drivers. And they make up a combined roughly 60% of, of our portfolio. And this is uh, the portfolio as it stands at the moment um, uh, on a sectoral basis. Um, a lot of pension funds, a lot of investors historically have invested in real estate uh, and they'll have most of their portfolio expo exposed to the three traditional uh, food groups of office, retail and industrial. Um, and that's been fine historically, but you can see here a much broader diversity of, of different uh, types of real estate and more skewed towards those beds, meds and sheds sectors uh, where we see strong uh, uh, growth drivers. Residential being an overweight, healthcare being an overweight, self-storage, a great cash flow area uh, uh, being, being overweight as well. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, on a regional basis, you can see a reasonable exposure to the US uh, and as I mentioned, UK, uh, albeit it is an overweight relative to the benchmark, it only is about 6% of the portfolio, and we think very good, uh, very good quality companies. Uh, underweight to some of those more highly levered markets, Europe, <clears throat> Japan, and Singapore, um, uh, given our preference for more resilient um, uh, balance sheets uh, through the cycle. Uh, I wanted to highlight just quickly um, one of the larger positions in our portfolio, uh, Prologis, which is one of the largest logistics um, uh, warehouse owners in the world. Um, around about 2% of global GDP is estimated to flow through global uh, Prologis' warehouses every year. And obviously, um, uh, logistics has been benefiting from uh, e-commerce for a number of years, but also uh, in the current environment, supply chain resilience is, is a key thematic that's driving demand for, uh, for warehouses. As we see supply chain disruptions causing many people to rethink where they stock and how much they stock uh, product. And we've gone from an environment of just-in-time inventory management to just-in-case inventory management. Uh, and as a result of you know, the confluence of you know, strong demand and you know, in, in infill markets, relatively limited amounts of supply, um, we're seeing very low vacancy rates, all-time low vacancy rates in many industrial markets. So Prologis is, um, uh, portfolio is almost 98% occupied. Uh, very strong rent growth in the order of uh, their overall portfolio has a potential positive 50% uh, rental mark to market, <clears throat> given the strong un underlying growth in, in, in market rents. And, um, and they're growing underlying earnings by about 11% per annum. So very, very well clear of uh, what inflation is doing at the moment in the US. Uh, and they just increased their dividend by 25%. Now, importantly, 
Prologis has got a very strong balance sheet. So, you know, four times debt to EBITDA or, or less than 20% loan to value ratio, an average debt maturity of 10 years and 90% of, it, of its uh, debt is, uh, is, is fixed rate. So uh, a, a very good example of um, uh, one of the more resilient uh, properties, uh, exposures we can have in the property space. So in terms of the outlook, no doubt about it, there, there is uh, many headwinds in, in the market, um, uh, policy error, and uh, geopolitical uh, influences and uh, rising interest rates. And in this environment, we're clearly seeing uh, a, a, a decline in, in transaction volumes and a lot of uncertainty about asset values. Um, we believe that the uh, public markets, the listed public markets, are already factoring in a lot of the downside that we expect to see from uh, in asset values, and the private markets are not. And we think the REITs are relatively well placed in this environment, given that supply is reasonably moderate, and we're seeing rising construction costs and, and more difficulty for developers. Um, we're seeing the secular demand trends, particularly in beds, meds and sheds, generally holding. Balance sheets are in good shape. And really importantly, REITs are providing liquidity. So if you need your money, you can get it back. We've never frozen redemptions in any of our funds. Um, it gives us exposure to high quality portfolios. If you need your money back, you can get it. Or if you want to invest more at reasonable prices, uh, you can do so. Obviously, rising finance costs are a potential headwind going forward. But you do need to think about why, why finance costs are rising. It's because of inflation. And as I pointed out, we think real estate has the ability to be an inflation hedge. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop and uh, hand back to you, Rob, for questions. Thanks very much, Marco. That was a wonderful run through the drivers of performance on the portfolio and, and what we can perhaps expect into the future. A couple of questions for you. Um, I see residential has still been doing very well and it's a big component of the portfolio. Might we start to see some of that strength tail off as we're seeing some pressure on, um, on, on US house prices and obviously with increasing interest rates, that's going to put more pressure. So what's your outlook there in terms of residential? Yeah, interestingly, from, from our perspective, um, residential, the, the bigger risks to, to residential from a, from a US residential point of view is uh, weakening in the labour market. So you typically see a, a fairly high correlation between uh, rent, uh, rent growth and, uh, and unemployment. So if we do see um, rising unemployment, then we do think that you're going to see pressure on, uh, on rental values and occupancy in, uh, in, in some of the, the rental markets in, in the US. Now, um, uh, of course, you know, with rising mortgage rates, there is that logical question, you know, are real estate values under pressure. Uh, and that will ultimately uh, come to bear. But generally, you know, apart from the global financial crisis in previous cycles, uh, and global financial crisis was a combination of, you know, a lack of available finance, increasing costs, and um, and massive amounts of oversupply. Um, we did see asset values and, and single market, single family rent, um, values come down. Uh, this time around, we haven't seen anywhere near the amount of single family construction uh, that we saw in the lead up to the global financial crisis. So. There's a chance that there's not as much downward pressure on, on asset values. Um, uh, and also bear in mind that if uh, mortgage rates have gone up as much as they have, then um, the uh, equation in terms of occupancy cost to buy versus rent um, begins to favour more renting rather than buying if mortgage rates are at 6% or above. So um, it can be a double-edged sword. Uh, certainly um, uh, unemployment is something that we'd be monitoring carefully, um, particularly for the multifamily guys. Um, and to some extent, uh, construction and supply is a, is a good governor on um, uh, the, um, the single family guys. So you touched on office there in your presentation as well, Marco. Um, you know, it's a big sector traditionally, but what are you seeing in t from or hearing from the uh, REIT landlords about in terms of occupancy and what the new world of work might mean for them? Yeah, so um, definitely uh, we, we think that there's going to be um, hybrid working environment probably persisting for um, uh, for a much longer period of time. Um, uh, you know, generally uh, there's still an environment where there's a war for talent, uh, particularly in the tech industry. Um, so they're finding it very difficult to uh, enforce a return to office um, uh, for for their tech employees. And so, uh, and I think a lot of people are, are realizing that the commute is. Um, you know, a, a bit of a challenge for, for them on a day-to-day -day basis. So while we have strong employment markets, you're probably going to see 
um, you know, elevated levels of hybrid work continue. Um, the reality is, is that we're entering into a relatively softer economic environment as well. That's never good for office markets. So when you combine the two, um, we think that, you know, the, um, uh, the cash flow profile, um, the incentives required to attract tenants uh, and the need for modern and attractive buildings means that it's just a challenging time for landlords. They need to spend a lot of capex um, for uh, in a market where they're struggling for, for price and power. So we prefer to uh, to remain underweight and sit on the sidelines and, and wait for better opportunities later on. Okay, thanks very much, Mike, Marco. We're gonna have to wrap it up there. So thanks so much for joining us and providing us with some great information um, and uh, a tongue in cheek. Good luck for the upcoming Cricket World Cup. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers. Of course, that was Marco Colantonio, co-founder of Resolution Capital and a portfolio manager on the Ned Group Investments Global Property Fund. Thank you.